All right, ladies and gents, I think we're going to kick off the OpenAV uh, workshop now, talking about FabLab 2.0. So I'll just wait a few minutes and uh, see if there's anyone from outside still walking in. But apart from that, I can kind of talk a little bit about uh, yeah, what, what's going on, what we're going to be doing in this workshop. So my name is Harry, Harry Van Haren. I'm a lead developer of the OpenAV project. For the last year and year and a bit, I've been working on a drum sampler. So what I mean with drum sampler is we're not talking melodic sampling in that you know you you pitch one like audio sample up and down to create an instrument, but instead we're talking more about you know having a collection of samples and triggering them to form drum loops. So each sample isn't necessarily melodic content, but it's more uh, like a certain drum hit, like a kick drum or a hi hat. So that's what Fabla Two is aimed for. Um, and particularly for a, a live performance scenario. So uh, I have uh, on the table here in front of me a machine micro. It's a, a drum sampler, kind of a, a hardware piece of kit. And I have a little keyboard as well that we might get to using towards the end of the workshop. Apart from that, what I'd like to talk through is, uh, yes, I'm Harry from OpenAV. I have that covered. Essentially, there's a lot of features in the Fabla 2 sampler that did not exist in Fabla 1. So Fabla 1 is the currently released drum sampler, and Fabla 2 has these new features. So we have pads, live view, we have multi-sample support, so like multi-layers of samples. We have per-sample controls, so we can do a lot more flexibility and do a lot more processing of the samples. And there's per-pad controls. So it's a little more complicated, to say a little. Um, it's a lot more complicated. But that, that complication and those features actually let you do a lot more interesting things, particularly from a live performance point of view. Add on to that something that OpenAV is working on called the AUX bus, so auxiliary bus. It's a way of thinking about effects processing. It's a way of doing things like side chaining, reverb sends. Um, and it's particularly that to try and yeah, improve the way on, on stage you can work with these. Because a lot of the, like in, in Ardor, for example, there's really complex and amazing routing things you can set up, but they're not really workable in a live context, in my opinion. And the nice thing there is if, like about Oxbus, that we think about like effects processing in, in a much more limited, but also manageable way that really gives the efficiency of the workflow that, that you'll have live. So I'm going to first show, uh, wait, am I skipping ahead? Yes. So I'm going to do two little demos. That's essentially going to be the main content of this workshop. First, I'm going to run Jalv. So it's a, a standalone LV2 host. So Fabla2 is an LV2 plugin. So it'll work in most of your, your favorite DAWs. But first, I'm going to run it in Jalv, which is like a very minimal run it as if it's a standalone program. And I can show you just the features of like that are contained in Fabla2 itself. Then we'll bring in some extra parts, and I can show you how to do the, the routing or what, what this Oxbus feature is about. And then in the last bit of time, what I'm going to do is load up an Ardor session that I've prepared with uh, a little drum loop and some, some other little um, side things with side chains and some effects to show how I see this Oxbus feature being used in a, a, in a professional DAW for actual music production as opposed to live performance. So moving on from there, what I have at the moment is um, apologies for those on the stream who can, might find it hard to see. It's a, a dark theme, I'm afraid. Um, so what I have is Fabla 2 here. Basically, uh, this is the main interface. I call it the pads view because here in the center we have some pads. Um, if I play pads here on the hardware piece in front of me, then we can see uh, the pads are playing. I've loaded up five samples. These five samples are from the AV Linux AVL drum kits. So that's uh, Glenn MacArthur's uh, sampling project. He has some really nice velocity layered drums there and they're uh, open content. So uh, for this workshop, I thought it'd be nice to, to at least introduce how to work with multi-layer samples in this drum sampler and some of the, yeah, to, to introduce these samples as, as, or to use these samples to introduce them. So at the moment, the way this is set up is uh, Fabla is running and we've loaded some different samples here. So you can hear the kick drums. And this is essentially doing uh, taking five samples of individual uh, velocities. So the, the, the top one here is the softest. And if you listen carefully, each time it's like a more powerful stroke on a kick drum. I can turn it up here a little maybe for in the room. So th the, these velocity levels essentially give you when you're doing your, your drum programming in a DAW, or if you're doing live performance by actually doing, like playing on a piece of hardware, it gives you that kind of human feel, the realistic drum sound to some degree. Now, there's another project called Drum Gizmo, and they really take this to a whole new level, and they, they do studio-grade drums with like really high 
like I'll, they use up lots of resources of the CPU and things like this, and they get this amazing drum sound. Really respect their project. Fabla 2 is taking a different angle on drum sampling. This is more geared towards either you know your quick and easy, good enough sounding drum kit, or electronic music production, which is personally my own area. So Fabla 2 isn't uh, uh, you know uh, your replacement for the drum gizmo. Basically, drum gizmo does amazing quality drum sounds in the studio, and then Fabla 2 is more a lightweight approach to doing uh, drum sampling and trying to, to achieve reasonable results with reasonable amounts of CPU usage for live performance, more so than for studio grade work. So with that in mind, what I'll do now is I'll kind of just talk through um, what I envision most people will want to do with Fabla 2, which is load a few samples and play a little drum beat. So the next thing up uh, that I'll start is basically if we go here to this pad, there's nothing actually currently loaded on it. So if I click it, we see just a blank UI. But if we right click, it uh, shows us uh, a file browser and we can basically choose the sample that we want to choose. So let's get a snare drum, perhaps the Pearl snare, I like this one. So I've loaded that now, we can see on the hardware, I uh, don't know if the people on the stream can see, but I'll describe it. So on the hardware, the, the button lights up when there's a sample loaded, and then we can trigger it with the hardware. Still pretty simple stuff. Uh -huh. So there is something a little funky going on, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so if we load another sample, I've loaded uh, layer two just now, so I'll load layer three this time. So now we have two samples. That's one of the samples, and we have a, a switch mode here on the user interface, which allows us to change how the samples are actually going to be chosen. Um, what I'll do is I'll switch to uh, there's the, the different modes. The first sample, we're going to change the velocity map to just be from 0 to about 0 0.5. So these are float point numbers, basically what range of velocity do you want this to be on. So now we can see if I press this hard, it'll choose the other sample. So this is like, if the harder I press the button here, the different sample it's going to choose based on velocity mapping. There's four types of mappings here, so it's flexible enough. There's round robin, that's the one on the kick drum here. Then there's the, um, the different velocities, so if I press it hard or if I press it very soft, it'll pick a different sample. And there's also uh, some, some others that I'm still kind of prototyping a little. There's one, it just plays the same sample every time. Ideal for music production, like real electronic music production. Take a kick drum and just leave that kick drum sounding the exact same. But then for more uh, yeah, humanistic or human kind of feels or just more dynamic music that you're not really looking for a, a, the exact same kick drum all the time, you can do some things like weighted random and these kind of other uh, scheduling, I guess, sample scheduling things. Um, just to continue on, let's load up a, a little uh, hi-hat somewhere as well. There's a, I'm sure there's a hi-hat here somewhere. I don't see it just yet. Where is it? There we go. Rock hat closed. Sounds good to me. So then you can just play really simple drum beats. Nothing fancy there, but it's enough to kind of have a bit of fun if you're playing with your bandmates. Okay, that's the basics of loading samples in Fabla and playing them. So the other fun thing is live view. So you'll see here on the left, we have a little label called views, and then we can trigger pads. So that's the one that we're currently on. But if I switch to live view, then you can see three of the faders here are up. So they're the samples that are loaded. And what this gives you is essentially, just like the analog mixer here in front of me, a view of everything in the 16 pads that we were just looking at. So the, the information is the same, it's just a different point of view on that same information. Where am I trying to go with this? So if we go back to pad view, I can see here that we have, for example, a fader. And that fader is the same fader as the one that's actually here. So there's, there's multiple ways of looking at the same data, but depending on what you're currently doing, you want to be able to see other information. Here, you can really easily balance this drum kit. So say that hi-hat is a little quiet, what we can do is just bring the fader up. And yeah, that one's quite okay, but maybe the clap needs to come down just a touch. So. Maybe that's better, who knows. The point being, if we have a lot of samples, then you need an easy way to be able to mix these, right? Now there's some more complex issues, which is that every one of these kick drum samples has its own, like you, you might have not sampled them at exactly the same gain. So if we click this pad here, or this sample rather, we can individually adjust the gain of each of these layers. But because we need to be able 
balance the layers and actually mix the whole, all of those layers afterwards, you need two volume controls, one per sample and also one per pad. And the pad here being just this bottom left one for all the different kick drums. So in live view, you don't see the, the each individual sample's volume anymore. You only get the fader, which is actually the whole kick drum. So this is kind of like you need to abstract away the lower level details as we move through the views. And that's exactly what this live view does. So it takes um, these pads and pre presents you with faders, just like an analog mixing desk, like what you'd be used to if you're a sound engineer and you have a kick drum microphone here, you have a snare drum microphone, and then you mix those. Now, some of the more advanced features, um, will I go straight to them? Yes, I suppose I will. Um, so we've loaded some samples, we've mixed them roughly according to this. Now what we want to do is to apply some reverb. And we want to apply reverb to the hi-hat and the snare drum, so a little bit on the hi-hat, a bit more on the snare drum, give it a nice tail, but we do not want any reverb on the kick drum. This is quite a common thing because kick drums are loud and they make reverb sound really muddy, particularly in a live context, so that's not what we want. How do you do this? With FabLab 1, so the previous generation, this just wasn't possible because internally the drum sampler would mix those samples together, output one stereo, and there's no way to retrieve the kick drum without the snare and the hi-hat signal anymore. They're all mixed together. So what does this aux bus feature that I've been ranting about for the last year actually do? It presents more outputs. It's pretty simple. On anyone familiar with analog mixing desks, you usually have your master faders and then you have one or two group faders or buses. Um, and what those do is they essentially take the signal from a range of other tracks and mix it into one. Similarly, here what we have is 16 pads, so 16 tracks, shall we say. And we have four auxiliary buses. So an auxiliary bus is just somewhere where audio gets routed to, gets processed, and then gets sent to the master. Now, in the case of Fabla 2, this is a little different because we have this fantastic thing called jack. So I thought, why would I leave the internal routing of the reverb or delay or the compression just inside Fabla 2? Why don't we expose it to jack and let people choose their own effects to actually process this with? OK, enough talking. I'll get to actually doing something useful. I'm going to load up uh, another of the OpenAV plugins. This one is Rumi. It's a reverb. Uh, yeah, you can see that, OK. So what are we actually trying to do again? We're trying to apply some reverb to the hi-hat and the snare drum, but not the kick drum. How do we do this? We're going to turn up the top dial here. So it's a little difficult to see, perhaps. Uh, there we go. Um, so we can see that there's a dial at the very top. The first dial along the cr across here at the top is they're all orange colored, and this slider is colored orange too. So they represent the same thing. Essentially, everything along the top, the first dial, gets sent to this first auxiliary bus. And that's the one that I've labeled as reverb or delay. Now, of course, people are free to abuse this to whatever they like, but I think it's a pretty, use case, pretty useful use case, or pretty normal use case even, to work with that as a reverb send. So you'll see that I turned up the snare quite a lot, and I turned up the hi-hat to about halfway. And what that's going to do is it's going to take the signal that is output on that pad and it's going to mix it into this auxiliary bus. What we're going to do now in Jack is route from the output from that auxiliary bus to this uh, roomy effect, which is a, a, a reverb. And we're going to turn the reverb 100% wet. So if we turn up the reverb send here, it's not going to increase the actual volume of the sample itself. You're not going to hear the input audio coming into that aux bus at all. That just gets discarded. The reverb that results from this actual audio coming in is going to be heard, however. So it's like a crossfader between wet and dry. That's literally what it says on the dial there. We're turning it to 100% wet, which means that the, the dry sound won't be there. That's kind of important for mixing because you, don't want to, you want to be able to increase the volume of a snare drum with the reverb being proportionally louder, but not if you increase the amount of reverb, you don't want the snare to get louder. Um, anyway away from the, the sound, sound engineering topics. Um, I'll showcase very quickly what's actually happening right now. So we see that Fabla exports quite a few output ports. There's two master left, master right. They're fairly obvious. And then there's auxiliary one left, auxiliary one right, auxiliary two, auxiliary three, auxiliary four. So we were using auxiliary one earlier. Let's connect that to the roomy input on the left, and let's take the one for the right to the right. At the same time, what we can do is take the output of roomy and connect it to the system. So essentially the playback. 
Now remember that the output of Rumi is purely wet reverb. There's no dry sample there at all. Okay, what I'll do is I'll turn down the reverb here. We'll play the snare and I'll gradually turn this up. And then you can see, okay, there's a bit of, bit of uh, reverb coming in there as well. What I'll do is just turn those up. But the kick drum is still dry. There's no reverb now. And that's the feature that has essentially, in my opinion, been missing from, well, at least the, the Fabla 2 sampler, but perhaps even more of the general Linux audio system that we can't achieve this mix of certain notes get reverb and other notes don't within one instrument. Because if you have a stereo output, you've mixed them all together and it's too late. For workflow reasons, that's a really, really important thing that, I, like as OpenAV and as the software that I'm working on, it, it, this is the type of workflow that musicians want to use live on stage. This is something like, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I have a sampler, I need to be able to send things to reverb and other things not. It, it's a very basic feature and it's possible using this as, uh, yeah, using FabLab to, to do, use this AUX plus feature. Now, it is also possible to do this in Ardor already with FabLab 1. You load two instances of the same sampler, and then depending on which samples you want to have reverb or not, you can switch between two different tracks. This means you're editing two tracks of MIDI. You have to copy-paste snare notes across. Your hi-hat kick drums are on one track, and your snares are on the other track, because, come on, that's not a workflow. It doesn't work. It's like, I've tried. I've tried, and it just doesn't work. So that was the, the motivation behind Fabla 2 and this AUX bus feature, which essentially takes your tracks, has these four auxiliary sends, and lets you do the same thing that this analog mixing desk does and mix down your samples in a way that's much more musically inclined. So that's the, the main kind of use case right now. I'll cover it a bit more when I load the Ardor demo later, because I actually have a sidechain set up there as well, from the kick drum to a, a, a bass line. But what I'll focus on first is a little more of the features of Fabla 2 because it has a couple of tricks up its sleeve. I don't know where to start because I basically, I coded this stuff in the last two weeks and it's almost certainly going to go wrong at some point. But it'll be fun, so let's go. Um, what, what plans do I have for Fabla 2? So these are things that probably won't be in the 2.0 release, but hopefully in 2.1, 2.2, when it's actually became stable and done. So we have something uh, called the sequencer. I presume most people are fairly, fairly familiar with how this works. You have essentially 16 steps or 32 steps. You program in your beat and then it goes and plays it. So this should work and it probably won't. Um, okay, let's have a look. If not, I need to set this. Ah, yes, okay, no. So I can demo this graphically, shall we say, or uh, for anyone particularly interested in this feature, um, talk to me after the workshop, I'll be around, I'll have this stuff set up somewhere on a table, and we can do that. The reason it's not working now is I have two versions of FabLab, one with the fancy features with some other things disabled. Um, I'll show you the sequencer after the workshop. What I can show you now, though, is uh, some other... Um, kind of use cases that I've been thinking about for Fabla. So right now, if I, if I play these, what we've done is we've loaded audio samples into these pads. But why not be able to sample MIDI notes in there as well? Because there's a lot of scope to being able to trigger like specific chords or something like this, just purely in MIDI. So what I'll go is jump back to here. I'll grab the Alsa MIDI port. LPK goes to, ooh, this might be a little difficult. A <laughs> two seconds, A two J A M E D D minus E. All right. And there we go. All right, we'll connect this to Fabla two. Okay, let's see if this works. And of course we'll need something to generate some audio. So I'll grab Zinat sub effects. There we go, we'll take the advanced one. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> All right, we'll grab a preset, close. Now, a little more routing and we're almost there. So we see that Fabla 2 has a MIDI output port. This looks a little bit suspect because it's a drum sampler, why would it have an output port? Exactly this use case. So we can sample MIDI notes from, for example, this keyboard in front of me into one of the pads and then have that pad when we play it, rather than outputting audio, have it output MIDI notes, which we can send to any synthesizers in at sub effects in this case, which allows us to basically build a kind of a chord sequence in some pads. 
And then we can take the output of Zinad Soap, for example, and add that to the system. So hopefully, if I get this all right, to bring this one back, okay. Things are starting to get a little more complicated, but let's try to keep on top of it. Can we see all of that? Yeah, okay. So uh, first we'll test Zinad Soap with a little uh, keyboard. Okay, that's working. Now what I'd like to do is play some notes here. You can see that currently the, the keyboard is actually lighting up the, the drum notes on the, the user interface of Fabla 2. However, what we wanted to do was actually um, have these MIDI notes be recorded into Fabla. So Fabla has a recording feature. It can record both audio and MIDI. So what I showed currently was loading drum samples as WAV loops from uh, the hard disk, essentially. If I had a microphone and things, I didn't bring them, I didn't have enough space in my bag, but it can be done, and I will show it in a, a future OpenAV video, that if we have a sound card or a microphone plugged in, that we can basically beatbox or record samples into each pad in Fabla, and then it will... And then it'll um, play back whatever samples you have. Now, some really important features there are if we have samples that have been recorded on the fly, we need to be able to change the start point of that sample because chances are if I press this button and go to beatbox something at the same time, I'm not going to quite sync them up. So what you do is you record it, like you, you beatbox, you press record, you go and then you stop recording. And then afterwards you just adjust the start point of that sample to where you want the actual kick to start. And that means if I'm drumming, the moment I hit the pad is actually the same moment the sound starts, not a lead in of silence and then the kick. So th these are the kind of workflow items that need to be, for, for live performance, these need to be very much streamlined. And that's kind of the, the workflow that I've been working on here with these things like changing your start points pretty easily. And it takes a little requirement, you know, if you're, you can record those three hits individually, but then you do need to kind of tweak them for, you know, five to ten seconds before you can do something with that. And that's something I haven't seen how to fix that problem yet of having to edit those samples. In theory, it's possible to do uh, onset detection of the recording and then like choose a sample point or a sample start point automatically. And that is something that I'd like to look into and, and try and really make this totally live proof so that I literally press these three buttons while beatboxing and it's sampled and automatically adjusted the parameters of sample playback to be like the most live and intuitive way of performing. Okay, moving on from here, what I was talking about was recording things. So, I, I won't demo the audio recording because it's pretty self-explanatory. If we make Zin output some audio and record it to a pad, the pad will play it back just like it's playing back the WAV loops. But the MIDI sampling is a bit more fun. Um, so, I'm going to tr attempt that right about now. Um, if I press a button here on the hardware, you see it light up, and that will automatically record into that pad next when you're playing. So, I press this one, then there's a record button on the hardware here, I'll sync up three notes, and then it doesn't work. <laughs> um, let's have a look. So, I think I have some uh, debug output here of Fabla somewhere. Okay, so we can see that uh, essentially if I press this pad, it is writing MIDI notes. Yes, they're printfs in a real-time callback, I should not be doing that. <laughs> um, there are some other things here that I shouldn't be doing, but let's have a look. Um, Yes, there's a, a weird little one that Zin adds to um, connecting to the, that one doesn't work, but if I connect it to A to J, yeah. So what just happened is we sampled some notes. I'll, I'll sample three different notes. All right. So they're sampled into this pad right now. If I switch to a different pad, what I can do is sample three different notes. Okay, that's reasonable. Now keep going, we'll sample maybe this, and then we'll sample something else again. All right. So there's a really, really basic chord sequence on four pads, but that means you can go. Oh, two seconds. I don't have a kick drum anymore by the little sounds. I wonder what happened there. I probably over recorded it with something, all right. Ah, thank you very much. That was it indeed. Um, except for that I just recorded silence over all of them, so <laughs> I'll, I'll load up a sample here. Um, there we go. Okay. Oop, yeah, okay. Uh, do -do -do -do. Get rid of that one. Ooh. Or perhaps. 
okay, something's gone weird here. This is a good example of why Fabla 2 is not released yet. <laughs> and I have maybe a different solution. Okay. So you can see that it becomes relatively okay-ish to uh, get, get these things, you know, live performance with these tools working. Some cooler features of Fabla 2, and I'm a little conscious of time. Okay, I have about 10 minutes left. Um, so what you saw here is relatively basic uh, things going on. What we would probably like to do is if we press one pad and we let go of it, it will play these notes and send note off events as well. And then if we play the next pad, it will play note or send note ons and then send note offs. But sometimes you want to basically stop the previous chord playing a little sooner than expected, even though you're still holding the note down, essentially mute the older playing ones and start a new set. This is particularly relevant with kick drums for electronic music. Anyone who has familiarity with 808 kick drums, there can be very, very long samples, you know, the real heavy punch one. And then there's the short 808 kick. And if you play the short kick, you want to first mute the or at least at the same time, mute the, the long punch, like the really drone boom, 808 kick. So you can do this, and it's using these two features here, we have MT and OF. So MT is mute, and OF is your off trigger. A mute group is essentially a group of samples that if one plays, it's gonna stop the other ones in the same group as it. But rather than having that tied just to, you know, if you play a sample in this group, it will automatically mute all the other ones in the same group. There's a concept here of having split that in two. So you can put all these samples in one mute group, but you can also have kind of a, a, a trigger group to turn all the other ones off. Okay, hard to explain. What am I trying to say? I'm going to grab this chord, for example, and I'm going to put it on the mute group of one, uh, if I can. There we go. And I'm going to change the off group to one. Similarly, for this sample, I'm going to do the same thing. So what should happen now is if I press one of these buttons and then press the other, it's going to mute the previous chord or at least send the note off events corresponding to the note ons it had sent earlier. So the synthesizer will, should react and mute the other notes. So what this gives us is a situation where essentially if you're doing live, live performance with chords, it'll kind of clean up the previous chords and keep, it should keep a more you know, def well-defined chord progression. So I'm still holding the first chord I played just there, but it's been muted because I played a second chord afterwards. It's, and a few note off messages were missed. Um, so you can see, see the, the use case of it there. Kick drums being one very primary use case. Uh, another being drum loops, actually, if there's a, a drum loop playing that you can switch between them using a fairly primitive way of sending mute groups. The other being this MIDI sampling so that you can turn notes off on a synthesizer when you're triggering different things. It allows also really fast kind of beat programming and doing kind of fancy tricks and automatically all these samples being cleaned up. Why would we split the offset and the mute is basically if you want a, a symbol to also be the end of your chord sequence or the end of your bass line, then you want to press the symbol and have the bass line automatically be muted every time you press that symbol or some sound effects. And that's exactly what this allows. So it allows the offset or the off trigger, which is currently number one here, to be different than the mute group. Um, if anyone has questions about this, I won't go on about it now, but do come talk to me later. I can try and load up an 808 example and try and make it more clear as to why I think this is actually really uh, an awesome feature for live beat programming in particular. So what have we covered? We have uh, the pads view, we have the live view covered, we have the auxiliary buses being sent. We have external effects, including uh, magic routing in jack, or QJack control, as the case may be. Um, we've covered sampling, sampling audio, sampling MIDI notes. And the next step is to kind of think about, OK, what else can we use this aux bus feature for? So there's a sidechain uh, auxiliary bus as well, which is ideal for if you have a kick drum and a bass line beside each other. And Quite often in a live context, when there's a kick drum, you want to mute the bass because they'll interfere in frequencies usually. And when the kick drum dies away, usually a pretty short envelope on an acoustic set at least, then you want to bring the bass line back up. Another use case, minimal house music, where you have that button, button, button. That's all side chaining. Envelope of the kick drum, then take away the bass. If there's no kick drum, bring back up the bass. So they're the kind of use cases that this can be used for as well. Because we can, for instance, route this kick drum using the, the third auxiliary bus here 
as the sidechain key, which is the signal that's going to take everything away. Now, I'm going to like hack away here for a couple of seconds and set up an Ardor session. I'm going to first kill all of these. Um, and this is the little impromptu part of, oh no, wait, oh, the whole workshop is impromptu, my bad. Um, so we have Jack running, and I'll currently load up Ardor. Uh, so uh, there we go. All right. And there should be some nothing there. All right. All right. All right. We're getting there. So what I have is uh, an Ardor session here. This Ardor session contains uh, a couple of different tracks. So there's FabLab 2 is on one track. Uh, uh, that's this track here, the highlighted red one currently. Um, I'm trying to change that. Yes, there we go. So some interesting to note is that Ardor on the left, can you see that? I'll move it a little bit in two seconds. Okay, so Ardor has amazing routing capabilities. Most people are probably familiar with at least the basics of them. What FabLab 2 does is exposes one stereo master output with the LV2 uh, port group flags. It's a flagged as a master, so Ardor can actually, in theory, start getting very smart about how to expose these and how to route them automatically. What it does is the first two outputs, so the two on the very far left in the, the, the view here, are essentially the, the master outputs, like we saw in the previous jack routing diagram. And then each stereo pair after that is one of the four aux buses. So there's 10 stereo or like 10, 10 mono audio outputs in total, but they're grouped. Why does this matter? Because in Ardor's routing diagrams or routing dialogues, what we can do is start routing these auxiliary buses to different actual Ardor buses, and then we can do the processing in those. So that's exactly what's happening here. We have FabLa2. It's taking MIDI input, no audio input. And then in uh, the routing diagram, which I can't currently see, one moment, I can open up the routing grid, and what we can do is uh, da -dip -dip, we can see that we have Ardor buses. And there's a bit of a weird and wonderful uh, routing, bits of routing going on here. And let me take this down to the center. OK, so we have essentially the output 1 and 2 is going to the master in. And then we have 3 and 4, which is the first auxiliary bus going to the reverb in. And then we have uh, some other sidechain inputs going on here. So I won't delve too much into the routing details right now. Um, what I'll talk through first is the, the other tracks that are currently available. And uh, so there's a reverb bus that has the Rumi plugin, just like the one I showed you earlier. You can see that we have a, a X amount of uh, reverb. It's 100% wet. So I'll just send that away. We have some MIDI strings. Uh, I recorded the strings just so I wouldn't have to load a synthesizer right now in the process as well. Um, so there, that's, a, that's a bounce of the four chords that I showed you earlier, which were actually sampled from the MIDI track into Ardor. And then at the bottom, I have a bass synth, which is actually Robin Garius's reasonable synth that comes bundled with Ardor, playing some really nice low notes. And I was going to try to use a lead synth, but I didn't get around to that part. So the fun parts are essentially we have Fabla 2, which is going to do the drum, the actual drum beat. It's a really simple drum beat. It, we have a reverb bus, we have a strings bounce, and then there's a sidechain bus here. So, okay, I'll break it down a little. Fabla 2, reverb to the certain, uh, the snares and the hats. So they're being triggered in the Fabla 2 track. They're being sent to the reverb, just like we had in the last example. We have Fabla 2 again. The kick drums are rooted to the sidechain. The sidechain bus has uh, Ducka, one of the OpenAV envelope plugins, sidechain compressor essentially. The bass synth is being routed to that compressor as well, and that's going to give us the sidechaining action that we're actually been looking for all along. Okay, I'll play this first, then what I'll do is start muting individual parts and kind of talk through what happens when we do certain things. I'll just turn this down two seconds. And
So I may have lost the main Ardor interface. <laughs> I think I I I think it's here somewhere, but it uh, also seems to have disappeared. Okay, there's a different solution, hopefully, which is try and find it. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. Um, right. I do apologize for this, guys. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload this Ardor session because. With the dual screen, something's gone funky on my, my laptop setup. So give me two minutes. We're going to just run through that again very, very quickly. This time, hopefully, I will manage to keep the interface. There we are. OK. So that's that's the little uh, four bar or loop that we're going to have a, a kind of inspect a little and see what what the details are. Um, if we open the FabLab track here, we can see a really really simple drum loop happening with kick drum, hi hat, snare, hi hat, kick drum. Those are rooted as follows in the FabLab two interface. Now there's some little bugs remaining here, which include that certain things don't show up when the MIDI notes trigger them and such. But we can see approximately what I demonstrated earlier in just the Jalve demo. The same thing occurs here, that we have a hi-hat and a snare being sent to a reverb bus. The reverb bus, uh, despite that it's way down there, it is actually turned up. Bugs for remaining work to do in Fabla 2. But we also see that right here there's a dial which is uh, the kick drum being sent to the third auxiliary bus. The third one is the one I've labeled as the, the sidechain key. The important thing here is, uh, for those not too familiar with side chaining, is you have one signal that you want to be affected, the baseline in this case, and you have a, a, a key signal, which is when to take the other signal down. So that's what's happening there. Um, then let me leave that over there. Um, the other fun part is actually on the side chain bus itself. So this is Ducca. Basically, what it does is takes the uh, key signal, analyzes the volume. If it's over a certain threshold, it's going to dip the other audio. So it's a, it's a very simple envelope gate, essentially. Um, what I'll do is I'll just play this again. And we can actually see that if we set the threshold correctly. So what you see is that the screen actually indicates when the volume reduction is happening. And we can change exactly when it's doing this. Now, if I was to, for instance, mute Fabla 2, we can hear the bass drum is now no longer coming up after the beat, but it's actually being triggered on the beat each time. I can try and turn that up a little in the mixer because it's actually very quiet. Uh, there we go. Uh, this one. So it's still not particularly loud, but it's a bit more obvious, I hope. And what I'll do now is unmute uh, the Fabla, and then you'll start to hear that the, the bass drum actually comes up. Or the, the bass line. Either. Take this back. Mute the strings. Good plan. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me find the strings first. Mute. All right. Let's try that again. So the other thing that's actually happening right now is that the, I changed the delay time of the uh, Ducca plugin, which is here somewhere also. <laughs> there, spotted it. Um, so there's a time parameter. Which allows changing how long the delay is after an envelope before it comes back up. Now, in theory, or not in theory, in practice too, I suppose, um, that's synced to the jack or to the, the host BPM of the LV2 host or such. So currently, it should be running at 128 divided by one, two, three, or four, which gives you the, the like your time essentially how how long it takes before the kick drum comes back. Um, all right, I'll jump back to the mixer one for one moment. Um, as far as the demo goes, I suppose that, that's as good as it's going to get right now. I'll, I'll reload the session in a while on uh, offline and uh, kind of 
yeah, that was that. It, it's side-chaining, it's not particularly done yet. I, it still needs some work. There's a reason that Fabla hasn't been released yet, so that's what I'm hoping to get to here uh, somewhere. <laughs> uh, what? Okay, uh, two seconds. Um, and send, and send, uh, mini lock, bam, okay. Yes. So I've been through all of these. Fabla 2.0, is it released? No, it is not, unfortunately. Um, the source code is available in its current state on GitHub. It's relatively stable. It's not totally there yet. Relatively, I mean, it, it works for me, works on my machine. Um, <laughs> there's a bit of user testing remaining and such. So uh, I do hope to release it soon. I have also been saying that for about three or four months. So take that with a pinch of salt. At the same time, there is actually quite a bit of development went on in the last couple of weeks, months. Um, so th that's currently where we're at, hopefully soon. Um, thanks, I'll take any like pressing questions now. Otherwise, uh, guys, if you want to set up, then uh, that, that's, that's cool. I'll kind of talk for a while with any questions or anything. And then, uh, so the super bushel is the, the next presentation up. I didn't check IRC if there's any questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, cool. So uh, Robin Garius commented that Ardor's upcoming plugin pin management is going to be awesome with Fabla 2. I have never heard of Ardor's plugin pin management functionality before, but I'll definitely be looking into it after this. <laughs> I'm sure somebody here knows. Um, there's no audience microphone that I can see for questions. Bruno, I think there was a question there. All right, thanks Robin for chipping in on that one. And there's a question coming here. Well, you wanted to explain it afterwards, but maybe it's good to have on video as well. Sure. What is the thing with the, the start and stop uh, mute groups? Like, I, I no one understand normal music group, mute groups, let's assume other people do too, but where, where's the difference? Okay, so um, I'm just going to unpack while I do this. I hope I'm not being rude by not looking at you guys. Um, so what's the difference is that this allows you to mute a group of samples without actually the sample itself getting muted by the others in that group. It provides a kind of a, a piece of flexibility which allows you to do much more like dynamic mapping of on and off groups than you could possibly do if any sample in a group would mute all the others. It's essentially kind of like sending someone, hmm, what's a good analogy? Um, was there a suggestion there? No. Uh, um, I, 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 it's, it's a hard one to explain. And actually, I didn't think of this feature. It was a user's feature request. They said, no, you're doing it the stupid old way. Do it this way instead. Have two sets of groups, one to trigger other mute groups to turn off, and one to actually be in a certain mute group. And it, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a really nice way of working, because it, it, it decouples, essentially, a sample from being muted, so the thing being acted on, and the thing that does the acting. So it's kind of like orchestrating. It's like me saying to, uh, if there was a choir here in front of me, my lovely audience, you're the ba bass guys, uh, tenors, altos, sopranos, that I can say like, okay, you guys all stop, but I don't have to stop singing myself at the same time. Right. And I don't sing, by the way. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the, the use case in that you can control other things that are going on without being influenced yourself by that mute group. Right. Does that answer the question kind of? Or? Yeah, sure, or I can repeat the question, but yeah, microphone. So, if I got it right, you have the ability uh, to have like one clip or sample mute some other group of samples, but like if the others are, like, they're, they're not a group as a whole, as a mute group, but the one that mutes the others doesn't necessarily have to be muted itself while the others are, so you're, in that sense, independent. Effect. Bingo, exactly this, yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a nice feature, and particularly for live usage, I, I really like the. It's fact. very interesting because we're, we're very much like we'll see that in a couple of seconds when we're talking. Uh, it, we're we're thinking about very much related things. <laughs> Fantastic, great, great to have you guys next up as well. Uh, I'm gonna switch off here. Thanks very much, guys. Been a pleasure talking about all the features. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>